house today. Amen. 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 I sing it on the way to work sometimes. I just like it. Amen. 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 We're going to be in 1 Kings chapter number 17. And uh, we're, I'll share a thought with you this morning that the Lord's laid on my heart. I, I, I probably uh, won't be too lengthy, but we'll see. I'm not making any promises. Just making the general statement at home set of things, you know. So... 1 Kings, chapter number 17. I went to all this trouble and still wound up 2 Kings. Let me go back one. Good to have everybody here today. I do want to thank those of you that listen uh, by way of internet. We're glad that you listen. If we can be a help to you here at Elmire Baptist Church, we'd love to be. Amen. Always, always look forward to the opportunity. Appreciate you listening. Uh, it means a lot to me. All those of you from our from our home church that listen, it means a lot to us. And we're praying for you and looking forward to what God's going to do. All you uh, that's new to it, uh, that's reached out, we're glad you listen. Amen. 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 We're just here to be a blessing. I'm not no big famous preacher, and I probably won't ever be. Uh, but I'm glad God uses me. Amen. Amen. 1 Kings chapter number 17, and we're going to look uh, down at verse number 8. The Bible says, uh, And the word of the Lord came unto him, uh, speaking of Elijah here, Arise and get thee to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I've commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went unto Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. That sounds like a Baptist preacher coming to visit, don't it? <laughs> and she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. She went and did according to the saying of Elisha, and she and he and her house did eat many days, and the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into the loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, Hast thou brought evil upon the widow whom, uh, with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. Amen. Ain't that a good statement there? And the soul of the child came into him again and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in thy mouth is true. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word this morning. I can't thank you enough, Lord, for the opportunity we have just to be able to come in here and worship. Lord, I, I was excited to be here today. Lord, I was glad to be here. I'm thankful for, for the opportunities we have. God, I can truly, as the song sang, say, you've made me glad, Lord. As the psalmist said, I was glad when he said, Let's go to the house of the Lord. Lord, I'm thankful to be here. For the next little bit, head just round about with these four thoughts that I have for this congregation. Let it be a blessing to them. Let it draw them closer to you. If there's one here lost, God, today, let them get saved. Let them uh, submit to the calling of the Holy Spirit of God, Lord Jesus, and turn their life over to you. That'd be the greatest thing we can witness today. We need your presence, Lord. We don't want you at a distance this morning. We want you near. God, you're welcome here, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated. Thank you for reverence the word of God. Amen. I was thinking about this passage of scripture this week, and it's a very familiar passage of scripture, I believe, to a lot of us. 
Uh, some of you may have never heard it before, but that's all right. You're going to hear it today. Amen? And then next time I preach it, it'll be familiar passage of Scripture to you. Uh, but I do like this story. I always love doing in the Bible studies on Elijah and, and Elisha. And I, I like reading some of the things that God did in those periods of time. And, and, and uh, I was thinking about this passage of Scripture because there's a lot of, uh, of things to this when we begin looking at it. And uh, in, in Elijah's life in 1 Kings chapter 17, we find uh, that he, he's just prophesied that there's a drought coming and, and a famine coming. And uh, I mean, things ain't looking too good, if you want me to be honest with you. You know, uh, the weather report ain't good. Ain't no rain. Uh, and if ain't no rain, ain't no food. And, and if ain't no rain, ain't no water. And, and people's going to begin to suffer and they're going to begin to die. And I believe that sometimes... Uh, uh, we look around our society and we think, man, things look bleak and things look rough and uh, inflation's at an all-time high and it's hard to uh, buy eggs and milk and bread and the things that we need to, to just get by us and survive with. I mean, that's not talking about extra things you may have. And, uh, but I want to tell you and inform you today that God is not worried. Amen? God's economy is just fine. Amen? Uh, God still owns the cattle on a thousand hills. God's still in control of everything that takes place. And, and why it seems like in the United States and maybe the world uh, that prices have gotten high and things are hard to get, God's still just as accessible and able as he's ever been before. Amen? And so when we read a passage of scripture like this, we see uh, here that Elisha, he's been sent. Now, Elisha knows something about depending on God. And I'll tell you how I know Elisha knows something about depending on God because Elisha uh, has just spent uh, 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 some time over here next to a brook uh, where there was water and no food. It's just where God sent him. And God sent him there and said, don't you worry about nothing. I want you to go over by that brook and sit there and you drink out of the brook. I'll make sure you get you a meal every day. And the ravens brought him food and God is providing for Elijah uh, for this period of time until the brook dries up. Now, that's a pretty amazing thing. And so, Elisha said, well, I'm here and everything's dried up now. So, God, where would you like me to go? You want me to go to the Holiday Inn or, or the Marriott where I can get me a continental breakfast and have some big meals of the night? And God said, no. He said, as a matter of fact, i got a widow woman over there that's going to take care of you for a little while. You think things ain't bad when things are drying up for you. Then you got a widow woman over there. How in the world is she going to be able to take care of him? But Elijah had been sent to this widow. And uh, uh, this widow's come down. We read this story here. We'll talk a little bit about it as we go along. God uh, sent Elisha to this woman. And Elisha approaches this woman in, in, in a way that... I feel like it's probably not a good idea for you to approach a woman that way if you just walked on her property and said, hey, fetch me something to drink. And, and uh, why? And while she's going to fetch something to drink, he says, make me a cake too. I, I just don't recommend that. I'm just saying. Um, and, and I'm sure Elisha did it in, in, in the most polite way possible. We, we think of things in our terminology that didn't have such a negative connotation back then and, and all these things. But uh, this woman comes and says, listen, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, I, I've just got one handful of meal and I've got just a little bit of oil. And uh, me and uh, my son are going to eat this. And this last meal we got, and we're just going to sit here and die. And, and I think about that. And Elisha said, hey, you do what God says. And if you do what God says, God will make sure that you're never out of meal and you're never out of oil. Now, that's what my Bible says. Elisha said, fear not, go and do as thou said, but make me a little cake. Bring it to me and I have to make for, the, for, for thee and thy son. Verse 14, for the Lord God of Israel said, thy bear all meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail. You see the promise of God here, don't you? The cruise of oil and the barrel of meal. However, I believe in the good tidings and the presence of the man of God on her place. I, I'm thinking that this woman has uh, uh, got the idea here that, well, as long as the man of God is here, I'm not going to have no trouble. That everything's going to be all right because the man of God's here and everything's all right. But lo and behold, when we get to verse number 17, it says, uh, after they came to pass, after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick, and the sickness was so sore, and there was no breath left in him. You say, what happened to the boy? He died. You say, how do you know he's dead? Because when you ain't got no breath left in you, you're dead. <laughs> There's no two other ways about it. And, and I'm thinking 
talking about this woman. His boy got sick and he died and she cried out and Elisha takes him up there and, and does all these things. Uh, uh, but, but I'm saying in this woman's mind, probably uh, with a man of God there, and the, uh, I don't know how, what the period of time was, but uh, she's got this meal and she's got this oil and she thinks, hey, everything's going good and there's no trouble going to befall me. Uh, but yet here trouble comes anyway. And this is more than just trouble, ain't it? Because it's your son that's dead. That, that he's gone, and I, I, I think maybe in her mind she's thinking to herself, maybe we'd been better off if you just hadn't come in the first place. Because you offered us hope. Me and him was just going to die anyway, but you come and offered us hope. I thought everything was going to be all right. And now he's dead. And so this woman sees her dead son. This woman is familiar with death coming by her house. You know how I know? Because she's a widow. She's seen death come to her home before. She's buried a husband. He's gone. She's died. She's been struggling along since that happened. And, and when something like this happens, when somebody calls and says they're gone, I remember uh, back uh, uh, when we was uh, back this uh, uh, in the uh, uh, early summer of last year, I got to call while we were down visiting a new grandbaby. Uh, our new grandbaby that my grandfather died. One life came into the world and there was rejoicing over the grandbaby, but uh, my grandfather was dead and there was a loss of life there. And, and I'll be honest with you, I had to make a few phone calls because I said, all right, he's dead. When's the funeral? When, when, are we, uh, when are we making arrangements? What's going on? And they began to tell me these things. And I had to call. had some uh, preaching engagements down there that I had to cancel and move around uh, so I could be at the funeral and everything else. But that's sort of the mindset when you get that call. So and so's dead. Oh, okay, what are the arrangements? Because that's the only thing we can think of, right? When it gets like that, he's dead. You get a report like that, it's time to dig a hole. You understand? And I believe this widow woman here, I believe that she was in grave digging mode. Now, truth be known, if I read this story, I think she was in grave digging mode from the get go. And uh, because her and her son was going to eat a little cake and die. And now she sees her son dead. And as far as she's concerned, because of what she's witnessed with her husband, when death comes, it's time to go dig a grave. I think sometimes in our churches, I look around on Sunday morning and see some people that came in in grave digging mode. They come in with their shovel in their hand. Because circumstances is not meant what they expected them to be. And things in their life are not, uh, uh, all hope's gone. And, and uh, uh, all help seems to be gone. And you're at the point in time in your life where you're sitting here and saying, what's the use? I've been pastoring this church for 16 years. And in 16 years, I'm going to be honest with you. I, and uh, I, I've carried the shovel in with me. Because I was like, man, this is grave digging mode. All, all hope, all help's all gone and there's nothing left, nothing left. And I, I'm thinking about, because sometimes in our life it happens that way. Sometimes it happens in a marriage and sometimes it happens with our finances and with our job. And sometimes spiritually speaking, it happens to us. We get in grave digging mode because we feel like whatever we were trying to do is dead. And uh, I want to think about that thought uh, because this is the mode that this woman was in. And I want to preach on this thought. I've just got four simple things this morning that I think will help you. But I want to preach on this thought. Don't dig that grave yet. Amen. Don't dig the grave yet. And, and I want to look at these things. Though things may seem helpless and hopeless and we're ready to dig a hole, let me say there's still a God. Amen. There's still a God in heaven that can send a breath of life that will change your whole circumstance. Amen. They, uh, like I said, there's been a few times that I was ready to dig a hole. I could see stuff dying right in front of me. And I was doing all I could to keep them alive. All I could to try to keep them alive. And I watched them die anyway. I think about this woman holding her boy in her lap. as uh, He's standing there and he's dying. And, and she's got the promises of God on one hand but a dead son in her lap right now. And she's doing all she can to make sure that this boy don't die. And guess what? He dies anyway. I was listening to a preacher preach this week and he was talking about how he was going through a time of great discouragement. And he said, I, and, and pastors, the pastors will understand what I'm saying. He said it was Resignation Monday. Now, Resignation Monday takes place after Sunday. Usually, 
uh, every Monday. But the uh, truth of the matter is, is where you're sitting there and saying, man, I made a mess of that thing. I ain't doing nothing over there at that church. I, I don't know what we're doing here. And uh, he said, I, he said, but I was so low. He said, I tried. He said, I have things that were uh, dying. Things are going on. He said, I tried to go to my study Monday morning. He said, I was doing a root word search. And he said, I was trying to find uh, what was going on. And he said, I couldn't get my focus. He said, everything is wrong. And he said, I just couldn't get it. He said, I walked over uh, to my library. He said, get a book. He said, it's a book that I had for years. And he said, I reached up there and got that book. And he said, uh, he said I hadn't held that book in my hand in years. He said, when I got that book, he said, uh, it, it folded open. And there's a CD laying in that book. Now, he said, I can't tell you where I got that CD. He said, I don't remember buying a CD. He said, I don't keep CDs in my book. He said, I don't know why that CD was there. He said, I don't know where that CD was come from. He said, but it was a preaching CD. And he flipped it over. The title of the message was The Devil of Discouragement. <laughs> and he said, he stuck that CD. You, can I tell you something? Because that's what God does. Sometimes when we're ready to dig a hole, God's got a breath for us. Amen. Amen. Did you know in our church at any given time, revival's only a breath away? Amen. Amen. And so God can do some great things. I remember a couple years ago uh, that I was in a place of, uh, I'm talking about a place of discouragement where I could not, I could not see the top. I couldn't see no way to get to the top. I was at the very bottom of the bottom and did not know what I was going to do. I felt like I was Jonah in the belly of the well at the bottom of the ocean. I felt like man, there ain't a thing in the world and I was discouraged and people was calling me, say preacher, I'm praying for you. And quite frankly, I was like, that's not helping. I appreciate the prayers, make no mistakes, but uh, in my frame of mind, I, I, wanted, I, I wanted somebody to grab me by the collar of my neck and put me back where I was. Uh, you, you know what I mean? Uh, I appreciate all these things. So I was in that place and people were trying to help me and everything. And I done, I done called some of my missionaries. I said, I'm done over there. I said, I, I said, I'm, I, I said, I'm throwing, I, somebody else is going to do it. They'll be taking care of your missions from now on. I, I'm, I'm heading out. That was exactly my mindset. And I would stand there and I'd read my Bible and it was, I mean, I, I, I may as well just been reading the newspaper. I was trying. I, I mean, I was reading that thing through. I was, God, help me. I'm going to the Psalms, you know, trying to find those joyous passages where I saw that and it just didn't seem like nothing had happened. And I thought, God, what in the world am I going to do? I'm in a place of misery and I'm in a place of heartache. I had to shovel out. I, I, I mean, I was looking for a place. I'm going to find a place, y'all can throw some dirt on it, put me a little headstone up and say, here lies Jeremy Reddy. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I'd pray and I'd read and I'd study and I'd call and I'd complain and I'd whine and I'd do everything in the world and nothing seemed to happen. One night I just come in there and I was, I, I, I said, I'm done. I, this time I, I bowed my head again. Here we go again, I'm going to bow my head again, but this time when I bow my head, there's somebody on the other end. And God began to speak with me, and that very night I told my missionaries, I sent letters out to my missionaries, I said, I told you, I told you a week ago I was done, and I quit, I said, but I just want to let you know God has changed my mind. God has breathed the breath of life in me. And I said, I ain't going nowhere. I ain't going to let the devil deceive me anymore. Amen. Sometimes Amen. you don't need to dig a grave yet. Amen. There is a breath of God that's not too far away. And so I know some of you this morning have come in with problems that seem to overwhelm you. And they've overwhelmed your mind and all these things. And, and you've got your little shovel. And you said, I've tried this and I've tried that. And I've tried it over and over and over again. Let me tell you something right now. There's still a God in heaven. Amen. Amen. Let me give you four things. I told you I wouldn't keep you long, and here I am. Uh, just four things. They're not alliterated or anything, so you just have to listen and write them down. Don't dig the grave yet. The first reason you don't dig the grave yet, yet is because you don't know who might show up at your gate. Don't dig the grave yet because you don't know who may show up at your gate. Here's a widow woman. Uh, she's out gathering a couple of sticks. Don't sound like sticks. I don't know if that's even going to build a good farm. So they're going to eat a raw cake, I guess. Uh, but they make it. She got one cake left, probably for her and her son. They're going to have that thing, and then they're going to sit there and watch each other starve to death. That's what's going to happen. That is the plan in her mind. And so she's in graveyard mode. She's in
a grave digging mode. She's got the shovel ready. She's probably done picked the place. She's going to go up there and her and her son are going to die. Uh, and so if you could imagine this last meal they've got going on there. But lo and behold, if God didn't already have a plan. And who showed up at her gate uh, but the prophet of fire. Amen. Here come. Hey, listen, if somebody's going to show up at my house that day, I'm glad it wasn't Ahab. I'm glad it wasn't some of the. Uh, I'm glad it was Elijah. Amen. Uh, you may be sitting there today and you may feel like throwing in the towel and saying, hey, it's time to quit. But ain't you glad when you get to that point that God sends you a man of God uh, and he comes and says, listen, uh, silver and gold have I none, uh, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up. Elijah didn't come with no money in his pocket. Uh, he didn't come with no food in a bag. Uh, he come just as hungry as she was. But he showed up there and he said, I ain't got no food. Uh, I ain't got no money. But I tell you what I do got. I got a word from God. Uh, and I'll give that word to you. And we'll just see what happens. Amen. Uh, and so, you know, she didn't go get help. She was going to die. Help come to her. Amen. Sometimes we're doing all we can to go get help and to go get somebody that can get us out of this mess. Call everybody that may have some money or anybody that can help us. This woman didn't go, hey, hey, there's a song they sing, just hold on a little longer. Help is on the way. Amen. Uh, uh, it says help, uh, help won't help tomorrow if you give up today. Amen. Uh, you just hang in there, put your shovel up and see who God may send to come to your gate. Amen. God will send somebody. Amen. God sent the man of God to help her in her time of need. I want to tell you something right now. You may be at the lowest point of despair in your life, but I'm here to tell you don't dig that great yet. God may send somebody to show up at your door that will change your circumstances from where you are now. I don't want something more than you could ever imagine. And so uh, the first thing I want you to do is here. Don't dig the grave yet because you don't know who God may send to your gate. Number two, I want to say this. Don't dig the grave yet because you don't know how big your little may become. Right. Amen. 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 You say, well, preacher, I ain't got nothing. Well, you don't know how big your little may become. Now, I always like this story because it's the way I am. Because God never, I don't believe God ever filled that woman's milk bottle. I don't believe he did. I don't believe he ever filled her cruise of oil. But I believe every time she stuck her hand in the bottom of that barrel, there was enough meal for another day. Every time she dumped that cruise of oil, there was enough Give us this day our daily bread. Every time she come to get an evil walk, God makes sure you see if he had filled the barrel up, every time that she reached in, she'd see that level going down. And it would look like God was failing. But if you reach in an empty barrel that you know is empty and was empty yesterday, and yet there's another handful in there, uh, and you reach in there and you know it's empty the next day, and there's another handful in there. Hey, ain't no explanation for that, but that God is filling that barrel. Amen. 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 This woman had just a little. I like what this Bible, what it says right here. I, I, I like what it says because it's uh, this woman's here. Uh, she's talking about these things, and, and uh, it was just a little cake. It was just a little cake. That's all she had to give. Um, he said, "Make me a little cake for me." Would you? Can I tell you something? God can take your little and make something great big. Amen. God can take that thing. I want you to understand. You know, we may forget some things, but God keeps good records. Amen. Amen. God knows. And, and, and you know, uh, this woman standing here. See, here's, here's this woman's mentality. We talk a lot about the meal barrel. We talk a lot about the cruise of oil. And that was a pretty amazing thing that God done and something I'd like to see for myself. So every day that woman got that handful of meal and dumped that cruise of oil, she thought this is the payoff for doing what God said. Do you know what God said? You ain't seen the payoff yet. Right, man. Amen. Oh, we throw our ties in there and we get something good happens this week. We say, there's the payoff. You know what God says? You ain't seen the payoff yet. Amen. Can I tell you, I ain't even seen the payoff of my salvation yet. Amen. I love every minute of it. I love being saved. I love the presence of God. I, I love the fact that God takes care of my needs. I, I'm glad that my God supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory. And that is an amazing thing to see how God provides. If I can stand up here, my wife and I, and tell you the things that God's done in our life, I, you would see. And I would say, man, that's the payoff. God said, you ain't seen nothing yet. There is a 
payoff of coming. Amen. There's coming a day when there's going to be no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more death, no more sin. Amen. No more separation. There's going to be a time when we ain't going to dig no more graves because uh, we're going to a place where there ain't no graves. Amen. Uh, there's going to be times when we're not struggling and battling with circumstances. Amen. I want you to realize something today. Uh, uh, that this woman thought she got the payoff with a little meal and a little cruise oil. God said, there's a bigger payoff here. And so he took her son. And she said, well, now what am I going to do? And God said, you ain't seen nothing yet. Amen. You ain't seen nothing yet. Because God keeps good records. Oh, some of them people hang around you, they must know you from times past. They try to keep their little record book. Yeah. Oh, that devil must says he got saved, but I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop. So-and-so says he's living right, but I know him. I want to tell you something right now. They may keep their records, but God keeps good ones. Amen. Hey, Amen. There is a pay hey, listen, there's coming a day that I'm going to get to spend eternity with my daddy that's done been buried and my mama and my granddaddy that I told you about dying and all those that's went on. There's going to be a day that I'm going to say, what a joy the journey was. Down on earth to hang out with saved people and experience salvation. But what a blessing it is to arrive on the shores of sweet deliverance. I, hey, I can't even, I, I can read what the Bible says and I can tell you about it the best of my ability. But it ain't going to compare to the day that when they say, lift up your head, oh you gates, lift up your head, you everlasting door, and the King of Glory shall come in. Who is this King of Glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of Glory. And I'm going to walk in there. I don't care about a mansion. I don't care about streets of gold. I don't care about walls of jasper. And I don't care about gates of pearl. But there's somebody I want to see. Amen. Uh, and that's my Lord. And that's my Savior. Amen. And there's coming and done. Hey, there's a payoff that awaits us. Amen. Amen. Number one, you don't know who might show up at the gate. Don't dig a grave yet. Number two. You don't know how big God, how, how big your little may become. Number three, you don't know what surrendering all to God might do. You don't know what might happen if you give it all away. I like this when I was reading this. It's interesting. The Bible always uses the right terminology at the right time. Sometimes we need to pay attention to it. It says in verse number 17, it came to pass the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick, and his sickness was so sore, there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, what have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come to call my sin to remembrance and slay my son? And this is what I like to say. He said to her, give me thy son. That's sacrifice right there. It's exactly what God said to Abraham. Give me thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest. This is what Elijah said. Give me your son. No. It's my baby. He's dead. Just let me hold him one more minute. Let me hold on to him. Don't take him from me now. You can imagine uh, uh, what's going on there. And he said, give me your son. And notice that uh, it says he took him out of her bosom. It don't say he took him out of her arms or off her lap. When you hear that word bosom, that means she was, I mean, her boy died. She's weeping. She's crying out. I appreciate the meal and I appreciate the oil, but I'd give it all back if I could have my boy back for one day. And Elisha said, give me thy son, and she's willing to give that son, but she's got that closeness, that affection, that relationship, and Elisha reached down into the bosom of that mother and takes that son from her. You know what she's doing? She's surrendering that son. She's saying, all right, here it is. You know what the best thing you can do in your life is sometimes say, God, here it is. I've done everything I could do with it. She's sat there. I'm sure she's, uh, I don't know how the breath was gone out of him. I don't know if she tried CPR. I don't know if she tried uh, hitting him on the back, doing whatever she could. She's done everything she can, and it's brought no avail. Uh, but yet God's man comes to give me that son, and she's willing to surrender what's most precious to her. You can't ever tell what my, don't dig that great, because you don't know what might happen if you was to surrender it all. All to God. Amen. Did you know before help could come, she had to give it up? You know why you're not getting the help you need? You won't give it up. 
Well, if God ought to do this, no, you've got to give it up. Because God can't do nothing with it till you give it up. I hear people say, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. I don't care what you're trying to do. Give it up. Amen. I like what the Bible says, casting all our care upon him. That means whatever care I've got. There God. Some people got this verse in their mind. It's their favorite verse. Casting some of my care upon him. <laughs> Not me. My verse, casting all of it upon him. Some people say, they come to me and say, preacher, how old are you? I am 45. Do you dye your hair? I said, no, I don't dye my hair. <laughs> well, how in the world is it so black? <coughs> I learned something about casting on my cares. That's why. I know this. If I don't have the money in my bank account or wallet to pay a bill, I can't pay it. You said, what are you trying to say? I'm saying, ain't no sense of me worrying about it. Oh, what am I going to do? Print money at home? <laughs> you know, uh, go go rob a bank? No, I'm not going to do that. I know I can't do nothing about it. So guess what? I say, Lord, you know what the Lord always does? He provides. Amen. You know, because I know at the end of the day, I'll get another check here in a week, and then I'll take care of it. I'm not going to sit there and say, Oh, what am I going to do? <laughs> what in the world is going to happen? I said, It's amazing, Mr. Preacher. I, I just, you got to help us and turn the lights out. Daughter, how do you think people used to live? Yeah. <laughs> how am I going to cook? Same way they did then. How am I going to sleep? Buy some candles. How am I going to watch TV? Don't. Amen. Maybe it's a good time for you since God shut it off for you to read your Bible for a little while. Amen. Amen. Maybe it's time for you. Hey, I'm saying, I'm not saying you have to continue to live that way, but what I'm saying is, uh, why well, fret myself over these things? Because the truth of the matter is, you can't do one thing about it, cast it on him. Amen. Because God has a way of breathing breath in something you thought was dead. You don't know who may show up at your gate. You don't know how big your little may become. You don't know what surrender all to him or to God might do. And fourthly and finally, you don't know, don't dig the hole yet because you don't know. You just don't know when a new breath may be on the way. Amen. Here's a dead boy. Here's Elijah. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know if Elijah knew what to do with him. I mean, I know Elijah didn't. You say, well, he laid across him three times. Yeah, he didn't know what else to do. <laughs> I've got to do something. But Elisha did the one thing he knew he could do, and that was call upon the name of the Lord. Amen. You see, Elisha knew something about it. He said, give me thy son. He took him out of her bosom and carried him up to the wall where he abode, and he laid him on his own bed, and he cried unto the Lord. <clears throat> Some people say, oh, there was power in Elisha's bed. No, it was just a bed. There was something about being up there in Elisha's loft. No, it was just, it was just his loft. He was a man just like, he was a human being just like we're human beings. He wasn't a magician. He was a man God used mightily. He did the one thing he could, the ultimate resource. He cried unto the Lord. He said, oh, Lord, God. Now, you got this mother downstairs, and she's crying. you got the man of God up there, and she said, he's going to do something. You go, oh, Lord, God, I don't know what to do. That's not the prayer you wanted to hear coming from the loft, was it? But he says, God, he says, listen. He says, hast thou brought evil upon this widow with whom I sojourn, my slay and her son? God said, no, the pay, she ain't got the payoff yet. I'm about to show what the real payoff is for serving God. Just hold on, Elijah, there's a breath on the way. Amen. I'll tell you here at Elmire Baptist Church, you just hold on a minute, there's a breath on the way. I like going over there and look at Genesis. The Bible says God formed man out of the dust of the earth, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about the breath of God. There's a breath on the way, a new breath, something when we thought maybe we ought to dig a shovel, get shovels out and dig a new hole and make it great because there ain't nothing fit. Just hold on to what we do there because there's a breath all the way. Amen. 
Amen. I've stood in this church before and churches like it as a member and I've seen them get down and you thought, man, it all hope's lost and ain't nothing we can do. We may as well shut the door uh, and go by our separate ways. Uh, but you know what God did? He sent a new breath. Amen. Revival came and that's what happened. And he said he stretched himself upon the child three times, cried unto the Lord, said, Oh Lord, my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And he's begging God and he's asking God, saying, God, you've got to do something. And this little mother, she's downstairs and she hears him up in the hall and she hears him praying to God and hears him doing all of a sudden. She hears him doing all the talking and all of a sudden she hears two voices. Little boy, Bible says the breath is gone out of him. And Elisha's up there and he's doing things all of a sudden. Oh Lord God, let this boy's soul come back into him. God, you gotta do something. Don't do this this widow alone. Bring this boy back. So, Elisha, all of a sudden, new breath is entered that boy. I like what the Bible says. The Bible says uh, about the boy. It says, uh, the soul of the child came unto him again, and he revived. Amen. You know what we need at Elmira? We need the breath of God to come in here and revive. Amen. We stand in need of revival. Revival is all only, only a breath away. It says, Elijah took the child and brought it down, to, uh, brought it out of the chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And said, see, thy son liveth thou. It's an interesting statement, see, thy son liveth. I think Elijah's saying here, now maybe I'm reading into this, but Elijah's made her promise that God would take care of her. If she'd be obedient, I think Elijah's saying, see, I told you. I told you what would happen. I told you what would happen if you trust in God. I told you what would happen that day I walked on this farm if you just put the shovel away and make just a little cake first. I told you what would happen. God said he's going to take care of you through this whole order. Did you see? You know something else about this woman? She's seen a real barrel full. Uh, I always have a handful of oil. The crucial oil always had a crucial oil. She's seen her son brought back to life. A new breath. A new life. Revival. But she still ain't seen the payoff yet. You say, that was great things. Oh, yes, but there's a better day coming. Amen. Hey, did you know that no matter how good we see it, there's still a better day ahead. I've been in revival meetings that I make most of uh, uh, backslidden Baptist in this. Amen. I've seen shouting and running, and uh, I mean, I've been in, I've been in places like, that you can only imagine where the presence of God was so real. You think, man, ain't nothing like this. Then you go, next thing you know, there's another one. Better than the last one. And you get into that and you think, man, that's the best I ever seen. I have not seen, neither heard, neither have it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. And we get to see some of these things on a daily basis. But I want you to know, God's mercies are new every day. He's going to do something like we, you know, we need to see that line when you think something new. Amen. I'm not talking about new religion, new Bibles. New song book, praise and worship bands. That's all we need a new breath of God. Amen. We need revival. Can I tell you something today? Put your shovel up. Don't dig your grave yet. Your circumstance or situation. Revival is only a breath away. Amen. Let's stand with your heads by a nice cover.